how are you doing with uh, getting ahead, with getting noticed? Uh, you know, we live in a, because of our social media driven culture, I feel like everyone, every one of us are like forced to like, you know, if you want to be heard, if you want to get noticed, if you want to get ahead, then you have to self-promote. And there's a lot of that out there, isn't there? Like, it seems like everybody has an opinion about everything, and they feel like it's really important to put it out there for everyone to hear. And, and so, you know, if, if you want to be heard, then you got to self-promote. And so you've got the achievers, and you've got the influences or influencers who are getting their voice out there, right? They're increasing their voice and they're monetizing their message. And as a result, you know, you got people who, you know, like their, their claim to fame or what they're selling is the amount of viewers or hits or likes or whatever they've got. And that's what gives them a greater platform, right? But I think all of us have this desire to be heard to be noticed, to, to get ahead, to, you know, to get our voice above someone else's voice. Like, my opinion is better than your opinion. And, you know, as we come into the holiday season, you're going to have friends and family get-togethers, and there's going to be some intense disagreement. There's no way that always happened in my home. Like, it's going to happen in your home, right? And then suddenly, it's this posturing of, like, who's more right? Who's louder? Who, who's more opinionated? Uh, who's more um, educated on the subject? And then everyone else kind of slowly backs down because they realize that person is either not going to back down or they know what they're talking about. And, uh, you know, so we kind of live in this world. It happens in our workplace. It certainly happens in most businesses, in classrooms, right? Happens in the locker room uh, where people are posturing and trying to get ahead of each other. And, and I think certainly every one of us have a basic need to be noticed, to get ahead, to, you know, at the very least to be appreciated and valued. I mean, we don't want the opposite, right? We don't want to be ignored and overlooked and underappreciated and undervalued. We don't want to be dismissed. And, and so what's the alternative? Uh, it's self-promotion. And I'll be honest with you, um, I don't feel like I'm very good at this. Like, I, th I think that in our modern era, you have to be good in order to gain greater voice, especially on social media. And, and I just feel like I stink at this, and I'll tell you why. Because I think, like, one of my core leadership skills is, like, being self-deprecating. And I think self-deprecation flies in the face of self-promotion because when you're self-deprecating, you tend to highlight more of your flaws and failures than you do everything you're doing great. And I think that that gets in my way. Uh, but either way, I think that, you know, there, like <laughs> we all, even people like me who struggle with this, have a tendency to still kind of want to get heard. And so like one of the things I'll struggle with is I don't mind pointing out my flaws and failures as long as others that I'm with kind of take a similar posture. But the moment you start trying to one-up somebody, then I like want to step in. You know, like I think what I react to is like the bullies, the people that are trying to push others down. And I'm like, well, wait a second. If you're going to push them down, then let's go. You know, and I like, I want to put them in their place. And, and I think that kind of all of us have that instinct. But not Jesus. In fact, um, you would not, this little verse, it's, it's a cool verse, I'm going to point it out to you, but it's like you have to almost look for it to even notice this about Jesus. He was going through all of these like no-name villages, and he's doing amazing miracles, the kind of miracles that if they were done today, they would end up like as viral videos all over every social media platform. And, and so Jesus is going through all these different villages where, where like, you know, the nobodies notice. And some of Jesus' brothers are hanging out with him, like his actual physical brothers. <laughs> and one of them says to him, hey, Jesus, like nobody who wants to be a public figure does this kind of stuff in secret. You should go to the big city where everyone will notice you. And, and literally the line after that, so this is, it's, if, you, if you're looking for that, it's found in the Gospel of John chapter 7. The very next verse, verse 5, says, because his brothers didn't yet believe in him. They didn't believe that he was God. So what they were saying was like, there's no way that you're ever going to accomplish your mission if you just 
stay in the, with the bunch of nobodies. If nobody notices what you're doing, even if you're doing something great, it's not going to make any difference. I mean, a public figure doesn't do stuff in secret. And I thought, there it was. Jesus' brothers were like the modern-day influencers. They're like, you got to get hurt. I mean, or at least, uh, you know, they were the top marketers. Like, they were like, Jesus, we got to increase your marketing. We got we to lead this campaign, and we got to work on this. And, and Jesus is, it's really obvious that Jesus' mission wasn't just to get noticed. And so if you jump ahead to one of those no-name cities, the city of Colossae, the Apostle Paul actually helped start the church there. It, the city of Colo- it, it's a has-been city with a small little church. And the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church from prison because he heard that this church had some struggles. They were struggling with religion and rules, and they were burying the simple faith of Jesus under all of this religion. But the reason is because these big-name preachers We're coming through the little city of Colossae and this little church, and they were teaching them uh, all of these rules. And so they were profiting, these big-name preachers were profiting off of all these little no-name cities and no-name churches. And so Paul is writing to the church to remind them of who Jesus is. And if you, as you jump in, we're going to turn to Col- the letter to the Colossian church, chapter 1. And I'm going to start just reading uh, toward the end of verse 18 and into 19. And, and all Paul's doing is, he's letting people know who Jesus is. He paints this verbal word picture of Jesus. And he says this, so that in everything, he, Jesus, might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. What what is Paul getting at? He he had just finished describing who Jesus is. And as he's uh, concluding his description, he says, look, God did all of that so that Jesus would be supreme over everything that he created. In fact, it was God's pleasure to put all of himself into the person of Jesus. And so what's the point? The point was, what Paul's saying is, Jesus is the top. He's the big kahuna. Like he's the, the by the way, that's not heresy. Like I'm not trying to mock. I'm just saying like, if you're posturing, like it doesn't matter where you land, you're not at the top, right? Like, and, and you know, maybe you're looking at it, you're like, all right, Jesus is up here, Mother Teresa. I mean, where am I at? Like, I'm definitely not even close, right? And, and so Paul's point is, Jesus is the king. He is, he has all supremacy, He is over everything. He's greater than everything. He's more powerful than anything and everything on earth. Not only is he over everything, but all of God is fully contained in the person of Jesus. And there's a point to what he's getting at. Because he just finished explaining the way we're supposed to live. And so then he holds up Jesus as the ultimate example. He goes like this, look. Jesus who, is, who has all supremacy, meaning if, if there's some pecking order, Jesus is most definitely at the top. But he goes like this. He goes, Jesus, who has all supremacy, laid aside his power, his position, his prominence, in order to take up the posture of a servant. And we should be more like that. And so this is the verse, right? He goes like this in verse 10. This is what we're supposed to be like. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. So that we would live up to the example of Jesus. Live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. So here's this. Look, here's what happens. Here's what Paul is saying. He goes, look, here's what I want you to do. As you grow in the knowledge of Jesus, you begin to do good things. Why? Because at that point, you're beginning to live worthy of the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. You're following in the example of Jesus. And when you follow the example of Jesus, you can't help but grow in the knowledge of God. And as a result, you'll do good works. Here's the thing. What did Jesus do? Jesus did not use his power 
to gain strength over the weak. He didn't use his prominence to belittle those who were beneath him. He didn't use you know, his glory to blind everyone that knew that they weren't nearly as special as Jesus. No, what he did was, was he clothed himself in humanity and humility. He poured out his divinity and he became less to make much of us. And the way of Jesus is this. This is what I want you to take away. If you think about, you know, um, all the activities during the Christmas season, one, one activity you might consider is emptying yourself of yourself. That's tough. In fact, maybe I'll just pause for a moment. Because that's hard. Can, so can I, can I give you that challenge again? You want to be more like Jesus? Empty yourself of yourself. Right, like Christmas season is like that, is a perfect time to wrestle with this, right? Because, I mean, Christmas season is a time where we're not supposed to think a lot about ourselves, but we do, don't we? Because the more we try to serve others and think of others and we're, sh we're going on the shopping list, I, I know you're a little bit like me. You're shopping for everyone else and you're looking at what you want. Come on, there's no way I'm the only one. And you end up finding yourself at the stores that you want to buy things for yourself rather than getting it for someone else. And then you're like, but you know, then you have to make an excuse. Well, I had to go there because I had to get this for them. You know, the truth is like, you're like, you're like everybody else, like a cookie for you, cookie for me, a cookie for you, a cookie for me, a cookie for you. Like, and I have six kids in the house, so that's one for each and six for me, right? The point is, don't we do this? We all struggle with this. And, and the thing is, the more, the more you feel like I'm trying to be selfless, I'm trying to give, I'm trying to serve others, the more you struggle with your own internal battle of selfishness, which is how come nobody's looking out for me? Man, I stayed up till two o'clock in the morning doing that and no one even noticed, they didn't appreciate like, we're the typical, like, if you know the story of Martha and Mary, right? Like, we're the Marthas. Like, I've cooked, I've worked, i cleaned. And then we, like, we have, we have arguments in our home of, like, who served more. I mean, I know Laura and I, when it's, there's tough days. And, the, and some, of the, some of the kids are really demanding. And I make this boneheaded mistake of, like, trying to tell Laura what I did. And then she just looks at me, and I'm like, I know. I don't know why I said it. It was just a dumb thing to say. Because, you know, like, the, but don't we posture to try to prove that I've given more than you, which all that is is selfishness. I want to be noticed more for what I gave. Well, where does that come from? That selfishness comes from a deep inner sickness. Selfishness is the result of sin. Sin is a spiritual problem where we're separated from relationship with God. And because we're separated from relationship with God, we're not becoming more like God. We're not filled with God or God's love and his selflessness. And so we live our life selfish. And you know what selfishness does? It hurts you, it hurts others, and it leads to destruction. It wrecks our life, it hurts others' lives, and it leads to a forever far from God. We spend eternity separated from God, experiencing the eternal death sentence of sin. And so what's the answer to this selfishness problem and this issue of self-promotion? Well, the answer is Jesus, right? And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, the apostle Paul is holding up Jesus as the example and said this, for God was pleased to have all of the fullness dwell in him. Jesus was fully God. And yet what does Jesus do? He becomes a man. He humbles himself. He takes on our sickness of sin. He takes on our shame. He takes on our guilt. Somebody who's trying to get ahead doesn't take on others' pain. Somebody who's trying to get, who's self-promoting doesn't lower themselves to take on the suffering of others. So what does Jesus do? He willingly humbles himself. He empties himself of himself. He pours his life out on our behalf. And so as Jesus' life is being drained out, he's giving us life. His death, the exchange for our eternal life. So when Jesus died, he died once for all. Our forgiveness found in Jesus' suffering. 
our life found in his death and then Jesus rises from the dead and in his resurrection, he is giving us victory over sin, victory over death and victory over eternal judgment so that anyone who believes in Jesus Christ by faith is forgiven and given new and forever life. And boy, for every one of you, if you've never received that gift, what a gift. What a gift that, listen to this, that the supreme God over everything would be willing to humble himself, empty himself to give you life. He loves you that much. To know that God loves you, let's not leave that gift unopened at Christmas. So can I encourage you, would you open that gift in your own life? Receive his love and forgiveness and new life by faith. And if you're making that commitment right now, would you let us know? You can let us know by texting the name Jesus to 81411. And I just want to reiterate it again. Please, don't just, don't just brush this moment off. Man, if there's something tugging inside of you, maybe there's a stirring inside of you, you're thinking, I need this. Can I invite you into a new relationship with God? Say yes to Jesus. And then let us know. Just text that name Jesus to 81411. You've said yes to Jesus. And And I want to be clear, Jesus is not only our example, right? He is an example, but he's not only an example. He is first and foremost our Lord. He's our King. He's first and foremost our Savior, our Rescuer, our way, right? Like, he's God above all else. And so first, I believe in him by faith, and he gives me new and forever life. When I believe in Jesus, then his Spirit enters into my spirit. And when God's spirit is in my spirit, then and only then do I begin to follow Jesus as my example. You, you with me so far? I, I pray this over my kid, my boys especially, every night. One of the prayers, and, and right now, they're in that stage where I'm trying to teach them how to pray. They're not quite fully confident. And so I have them repeat after me. One of the things I have them repeat after me is, Jesus, help me to be really obedient to daddy. No, I do, I do have them say that. Um, But I also have them say, Jesus, help me to become more like you every day. That's my simple prayer with them. And and, and my goodness, that would change your whole life. If every one of you uh, would say, Jesus, help me to become more like you every day. I promise you, I promise you, it would change your life. One of the things that we would require of you is, if you said, Jesus, help me to become more like you, is it would require you to empty yourself of yourself. Let me show you where I got that from. Uh, If you jump back just like literally one page in the Bible, but it's a completely different letter. In the Bible, you go from Colossians back to Philippians, but two different churches, right? One was written to the church in Colossae. One was written to the church in Philippi. Philippi was a suffering church, and Paul writes it while suffering in prison. But to the church in Philippi, he also holds up Jesus as the example. And if you read in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul writes this. Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, or like in the fullness of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Meaning, he knows who he is. He knows that he's fully God. But made himself of no reputation. There it is. The, The word there... Uh, it, it's a process to make yourself nothing. The, the, the word is kenosis, the process of emptying yourself, which is why I borrowed that term, uh, empty yourself of yourself. And what it means, it's not just making yourself of no reputation, but literally emptying yourself of everything that has significance and value. What Jesus did when he came from heaven to earth was this kenosis process of draining himself of his divine glory and recognition and power and all the, all the you know, uh, supernatural attributes of God that exist in eternity. Jesus laid that aside. He laid aside the royal robes of heaven to pick up the towel of a servant and became nothing. And so the apostle Paul holds that up and says, okay, if Jesus did that, what should we do? And in Philippians, he he, he explains that. Not looking to your own interests, not looking out for yourselves, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Here's the thing. We hold up Jesus as the example. 
And if we're going to be like Jesus, then we have to look out for others' interests, not our interests. We have to care about others more than we care about ourselves. Well, that's going to require you to empty yourself of yourself. Well, how do we do that? When you pour yourself out, then and only then can you fill others up. Man, what a powerful thought. When I pour myself out, only then can I fill others up. The, the most powerful thing you can do in your life is to make life less about you. You want to you become more? Make your life less about you. Be consumed less with yourself, less with your needs and your interests and your agenda. Only when we pour ourselves out can we fill others up. Right? This is what Jesus did. So if you follow the process, divine God, creator of the world, ruler over all things, the king of the universe. This is the, this is the ultimate story of the prince becoming the pauper. It's, it's the undercover boss that willingly clothes himself like an ordinary person, becomes one of us, and he's not faking it. He really takes on our suffering, our pain, our shame, our guilt. And Jesus empties himself, not because he thinks that he's not worthy. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He goes, he was fully God. He knew who he was. He knew, he knew how powerful he was. He knows that he's the creator of the universe. So he didn't, he wasn't doing this out of insecurity. And the reason I'm explaining that is that you don't have to think less about yourself because you think less of yourself. Okay, you don't have to think less of yourself. You just think about yourself less, right? This isn't about wallowing in insecurities. Oh, I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. No, I can empty myself because I'm not trying to prove myself. Do you get it? I can lift up others because I'm not trying to self-promote. And it's, it's really hard to build others up when you're trying to build your own reputation up. So Jesus made himself of no reputation to build up our reputation before the Father in heaven. Jesus was willing to give his life because he wasn't trying to protect his life. He was trying to fight to give us life. He was willing to take on our sin because he knew he was sinless. So Jesus was willing to lay aside and empty himself of everything to make us into who we could never be on our own, but only could become through faith in him, through his death and his resurrection. This is why the Paul, when he was writing in Philippians, he said he was willing to become a servant, obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. When you're trying to protect yourself, you don't willingly give your life. Jesus empties himself. Why? To fill us up. His blood was being poured out so that through his death, his blood would be poured into our life, giving us forever life. Jesus is emptied so that we could be filled. And, and so now let's hand it over to each other, right? It's this, the lesson, especially during Christmas. Is that am I willing to be poured out to fill others up? What's inside of you that you can pour into someone else? How can you get the focus off of yourself so that you're pouring yourself out so that then and only then can you fill others up. How can you make your focus about others, about caring for them, about lifting them up, about supporting them, right? Here, let's jump back into this letter to the Colossians. It says this, verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. What, really, not that you're trying to earn it, but you're living up to the example, up to the way, worthy of the way of Jesus and pleasing him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. He goes like this. So as you grow in the knowledge of Jesus, meaning how do I learn more about Jesus? And the more I know Jesus, the more I become like Jesus. And as I grow in that knowledge, I begin to produce the fruit of good works. And the fruit of good works helps me to live worthy of the way of Jesus. Here's, here's the principle I would give you. A life poured out is a life given away. How can you give your life away to others? This is what Jesus did. 
Jesus pours out his life as he gives it away. And every one of us, every one of us, oh Jesus, everything. We are the recipients of his life given away. We're the beneficiaries, right? Jesus literally said, I came so my life would be poured out as a ransom for many. And then check this out, right? So only a life poured out is a life given away. Only what's given is remembered. Check that out. Only what you give is what anybody remembers. Even for those that store up stuff, what, if they're hoarding it and no one ever benefits from it, that stuff is never remembered. Even, even the inheritance or even your wealth, the only, if, you know, whatever wealth you have, the only people that would remember are those that benefit from it because they've received something from it. Right, you with me? Only what's given is remembered. We worship Jesus because he gave his life away for us. We, we constantly are remembering the way of Jesus because his life was fully given away for us. He came as the sacrifice for us. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't work for it. Jesus came. He, re- he didn't use his power to belittle or beat down the poor. He gave himself up and made himself nothing to lift us up. And we remember the way of Jesus. So my my challenge to you is, how could you give your life away? What do you have that you can give? Can you pray for others? Can you serve someone? Can you love well? Can you offer encouragement, kindness, words that speak life, not death? Can, would you be willing to stop posturing, stop telling stories to make yourself look bigger or better, just make much of others? And as you make much of others, make sure your focus is on making the most of God. Right? I'm, I'm able to build others up because I already have more than I need through faith in Jesus. And so the way I'm able to love is only possible through Jesus. But I said only what's given is remembered. The Apostle Paul, in another letter to another church, he said, we do this in remembrance of Jesus. On the night Jesus was betrayed, it says that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He was gathered with friends. They were celebrating a, a holy holiday, the Passover. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you broken, given away. And then toward the end of the meal, he took the cup, a cup of wine. He said, this is the cup, the blood, my blood spilled out, poured out for you. The blood of the new covenant, a new relationship between us and God. So he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so the Apostle Paul, he's, he said, I'm passing that on to you. So he goes, be careful though. When you celebrate this meal, this communion relationship between us and God, make sure your heart's in the right place. That your heart's not focused on what you can get, but what you can give. Make sure there's not anything that's getting in the way of your relationship with God. So before you take this meal, take a moment, examine your heart. God, if there's anything that's in the way between me and you, would you forgive me? Would you remove that? So in just a few minutes, or a few moments, we're going to take communion together. But before we do, I want to encourage you, would you take some time right now, even as we go into this song, and would you prepare your heart? We do this in remembrance of Jesus, who gave his life, poured out for us. Before, before you have communion, the, the campus pastors are going to come there to give some instructions because we're going to do communion just a, a little different this time, kind of as a special way during the Christmas season to celebrate. So we're going to give you instructions. But remember, when you take the bread, it's Jesus' body broken. When you take the cup, Jesus' blood poured out. Poured out. Now, you don't, you don't have to be a partner of Lifehouse Church to take this. You just have to believe in Jesus by faith. And if and if today you said yes to Jesus by faith, 
then welcome to the family. We would encourage you to join us in taking communion together. So right now, would you take a few moments? Would you prepare your heart? God, I want to make sure I'm in a right place with you. If there's anything getting in the way of your relationship with God, ask God to forgive you. And so would you prepare right now as we go into this song to make sure your heart's ready to receive communion together.